I'm not gonna. Oh, let me. Okay, she can't get it. Hold on. And now. All right. Yeah, hi, sorry about that. My my Wi-Fi is always messed up in this part of the house. Yeah, no, I'm, I've been having difficulties with mine for the last couple of times. So let's see. All right. Um, see, I'm ready. All right, good. Yes, this is technically even good evening, um, everyone. Welcome to our special meeting. Um, our special meeting tonight is on our um, a discussion on the administrative building. We have um, our two experts here. I see Fred Seba. Um, I see James Waydig, and I also see where did he go? Glenn. Glenn, I can't fully see your name, so I won't be able to fully pronounce it. Um, it's Neuschwender. Neuschwender. All right. You Glenn Neuschwender, and you are from EnviroScience. Yes. Okay. Um, before we get started, I mentioned something um, the other night at our work session. Um, I couldn't say um, a lot because it was very um, new and so here I want to officially um, share with our community, our local PTAs, um, many of them know this person, um, Lori A. Zaman, um, New York State PTA president. Um, she is a dear friend of mine and many of um, PTA across, um, across New York State. Um, we have advocated together fiercely for Best for Children in Albany and many places across our state. Um, she did um, tragically pass away. Um, so I'd like to have like a small um, moment of silence for her. She, again, is a fierce advocate, wonderful energy, such a lovely person. She will really be missed. We have received a lot of um, condolences from the governor's office, from um, State Education Commissioner, um, so many organizations that we normally work with on a daily basis. So um, just a short moment of silence for a great woman, a great mother, um, partner, and um, advocate for the children of New York State. All right, thank you everybody. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so we are going to, we have laser here. Laser is gonna help us like he did, I believe a couple of meetings ago. He is going to monitor um, the YouTube chat live stream and he will pull any questions that are related to um, the administration building and he will post it in here. Um, and this way, Tracy will um, monitor it. We're gonna have like a 30 minute period. Like a, again, I think we did like a few minute, uh, meetings ago so that we can try to get through as many um, questions that may develop. Um, after that, we will, um, after this whole conversation is done and finished, we will um, briefly go into executive session to discuss personnel matter. With that said, um, Dr. Chase, do you want to take, um, you know, kind of lead the gentleman or are you guys just ready to share? Um, Glenn, are you ready to share, you know, your findings? You'll have um, a lot of questions from the board, I would um, presume, but we're ready to hear um, your. Sure. Sure. So I. Yeah, Glenn, I, I will just sort of introduce the community and the board as to how we arrive to uh, working with you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, obviously back in August, um, we vacated the mansion 
we vacated the mansion after you're hearing that there were several concerns. Um, concerns ranging from structural concerns, concerns ranging from the fact that you know, there's a possibility that there could be mold, there could be other um, air quality issues in the mansion as well. Um, we did a community walkthrough of the mansion. Um, and at that time, and no disrespect to Fred and Jim, we were working with a different architect team um, who also recommended that we vacate the mansion. And I wanna add Michael Falcone to the list of professionals because he too had uh, a, a, a list of concerns as it relates to the mansion and staff members have brought concerns with me. We have children at the mansion and because we do have children at the mansion and we have staff, health and safety was the number one priority. We moved everyone out, we went to the high school. Um, in July, um, additional concerns were brought to my attention. Um, I informed the board president of those concerns and then um, we ordered um, an environmental test because we wanted to find out if there are concerns that need to be mitigated immediately uh, upon returning to the mansion. Um, I recognized that it was advised that we can go back to the mansion and that we can cordon some areas off. Um, I still was a bit uneasy about that. Um, I ordered that environmental test. Uh, Glenn's company, EnviroScience, was the group that was um, commissioned to, um, to do the environmental test, and he brought those results to us. He submitted those results to our team. We met with Glenn because I had no idea what those words meant. That's a bit above me. I have no idea what they mean. Um, a little bit clueless about that. Glenn did give us an explanation of additional concerns that we have never heard of. Um, Mary was on that call. Michael Falcone was on that call. I immediately passed the report on to the school board and here we are today. So Glenn, take it away. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, in general terms, how this would probably work more easily is that I would open the floor to questions. I can summarize just briefly that our findings show there to be a moisture problem that exists in the building, the result of both the roof leaks and some issues within the foundation of the basement, and that there exists a VOC condition a uh, volatile organic compound condition from materials stored in the basement of a building that currently has no mechanical ventilation. So that pretty much summarizes our findings and I'm happy to entertain any questions anyone might have. Um, I do want to just say first, Antoinette, do you want the um, people to introduce themselves? I mean, I know you said who's who, but I don't know if people want to, Antoinette, I think you're muted. Yes, I'm, I, my, my apologies. Yes, I would say whoever's on here now, um, surely um, if everybody can just briefly say who you are, that would be helpful. Okay, that was Glenn from EnviroScience who just spoke. Yes. Thank you, Glenn. And what do you do at EnviroScience? I'm the president of EnviroScience. Thank, thank you so much. And then if they, everyone can introduce themselves so people know who we're talking to. Fred Seba from BBS Architects and Engineers. I'm one of the partners and the head of the engineering division. Uh, James Wadig with BBS Architects. I'm the project manager for the work that is being performed at Greenberg School District. Thank you guys so much. I'm sorry to interrupt. All right, thank you. Let me see, I'm off. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, um, Tanya, I see you have a question. Well, actually, um, I have numerous questions. I have questions for um, uh, Glenn. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry. And then I have questions for our architects, and then I have questions for Mr. Falcone. So I don't want to obviously hog the the podium, so to speak. So I just like you to tell me. How, how you want me to do this. Shall I ask my questions uh, of our uh, air quality experts first? Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, so Glenn, I, um, I, I read that report carefully twice. Uh, it was interesting to me for many reasons. And um, I, guess the, I guess the first question um, that came to my mind 
uh, and it may be a little bit of a technical question, but I'm just wondering um, what, what is the sort of, um, you, you clearly take one reading in a building in a given room on a given day, um, you, you collect air, um, and I'm just curious about what the sort of the standard deviation on, on your readings is and, and you know, how, how these vary, you know, what is, the, what is the precision of your instruments and then also what do you expect to be the standard deviation um, with respect to, you know, it, were you to do different uh, samples at different times, um, you know, for let's say a month or something? That's a great question. As you've characterized, our sampling is a snapshot in time. And so because we don't have the luxury of continuously monitoring these parameters for those fluctuations that you've identified, we instead have to take testing as uh, one of the arrows in our quiver. We collectively assess the site condition. We take the results in their totality. Um, and we ascribe a condition that is reflected in those results. Um, you may see variation, for instance, in a particular room regarding VOCs. There are a number of influences that can factor those results. Um, in this case, a lot of those factors or, and variables have been removed because the building was fairly secure and closed. So there's not a lot of air exchange that would impact uh, the variables on those results. With regards to uh, the mold and spore counts that we observed, those generally stay fairly stable except for the, um, the growth of mold given the appropriate conditions over time. You can imagine that mold is a dynamic biological contaminant as the conditions improve for its growth, so to speak, by increasing moisture and time. The nutrient source is always there. Those concentrations will go up. The VOCs, given the static nature of the building, would generally stay similar as far as concentration goes. I hope so, that answers your question. I, there's not a number. Does, you can I, mean, I guess one. Of, I guess a sub question of that is that the that when you guys did all the sampling, as you said, the the building was uninhabited and fairly airtight. So I don't know to what extent you think that that they that may have had an impact on your readings, particularly the VOCs, which may have accumulated over time, you know, as opposed to having a building that's actually being used and, you know, ventilated by virtue of doors, windows, being open, closed, people coming in and out, that, that sort of thing. The, the impact that you're describing is the passive activity within the building and its impact on the concentrations of the contaminants. Those activities are a small fraction of a normal building's activity, a normal building that has a mechanical ventilation system. Um, you know, Fred has probably spent years studying those concepts and can speak to it better than, than I can, but the opening and closing of doors, the opening and closing perhaps of a window during a seasonal time of the year can have some impact on ventilation, which will impact the concentration of these contaminants but it's probably a smaller fraction of a truly ventilated building than one would have if it was a mechanical ventilation system. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, absolutely. Antoinette, may I ask another question or do you want to give someone else a turn? Yeah, can I come back to you or is it a follow-up to this one? It's a follow-up to this one, but if you, if someone else has. All right, does anybody else have right now a question? David. Sure. Okay. So um, I've looked and seen that uh, depending upon um, what source I go to to find out the health impacts of various VOCs, uh, I get different answers from different sources. Uh, so I'm curious as to whether you have, uh, I, I mean, you've listed a number uh, VOCs that are uh, that are problematic. There's a, like a table 4C or table 4D where it shows everything in boldface if the concentration is above uh, a, a standard for what they can be. And uh, I think trichloroethane is probably the biggest one. And 
without having the benefit of an expert, I'm not sure what the health impacts are, but I can see that they need to, you know, we need to do something about this. If you were to remove the VOCs from the basement, and place them in a shed somewhere. We may have to build a shed. I'm not sure. Uh, would that uh, would that take care of that particular problem, or do we definitely need to put in mechanical uh, uh, ventilation in order to make sure that there are no fu future problems? Sure, that's a great question. Um, you, so let's t take a step back and look at this building. And as, as it was originally constructed, it was meant to be a, a residential structure. And then through evolution and time, we have now used this as an administrative space, primarily with the addition of, of materials and compounds used in, in maintenance activities, all while still preserving the the historic non-ventilated use of the building. So the accumulation of these contaminants in that structure should not be surprising. To answer your question, if we were to remove the materials that existed within the maintenance portion of the space, there's no doubt that over time we would see a diminishment of the concentrations that you identified in, in that table, table uh, 4B. The other contaminants that might continue to exist absent mechanical ventilation from the administrative activities will certainly be less, um, but won't be a number that is always going to be closer to zero because we have activities, whether it's copy machines or the use of uh, cleaners or things that have uh, petroleum-based uh, products in them that can contribute to that. But those are probably a small percentage relative to what we're seeing from the maintenance activities. Um, ideally, the maintenance component would be moved out of that building uh, for its future use and, and like you mentioned, put in a building elsewhere designed to hold those materials. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do we still need a portion of the, uh, of the ventilation stuff? We have a, a building condition survey and, and I, I'm sure uh, we're, uh, Tanya and I at least are going to, uh, and maybe other board members are going to come and talk to the architect here in a minute about what's in the building condition survey in terms of ventilation. We have something that, that needs to be done in the next five years, and we want to know how much of it we need to do right away. Certainly a healthy building designed in the 21st century is going to con strongly consider the, the, the component of ventilation. And we don't need to look any further than the reopening guidance developed by the state in response to the COVID virus, where the emphasis on healthy buildings is based conceptually on ventilation. Hmm. And so in a building like the administration building, we don't have anything more than currently natural ventilation. Hmm. And so just from perspective of the virus, we would say that we would only rely on natural ventilation and that's less desirable than mechanical ventilation. That's strictly from the turning over of, of pollutants within that space. But we'd also want to derive the benefit of both desiccation or the drying of the building through mechanical means so we don't have a moisture accumulation. Mm -hmm. And we'd also want to derive the benefit of, of, of ventilation from the health perspective of not accumulating carbon dioxide, the byproduct of respiration, and introducing more fresh air, including the component that is oxygen that leads to a more uh, healthy and stimulated building occupancy. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why ventilation is important, the least of which, or, or, or not the least of which, one of which would be the dissolution of contaminants and 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 they're well, not being permitted to accumulate. So then, your recommendation is that we do something to uh, to put in mechanical ventilation before we reopen the building. Yes, I th I think it would be desirable to always have mechanical ventilation over natural ventilation, and mechanical ventilation has all of the beneficial components I just said. That's a yes. That's a yes. That's a yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. I see Dr. Chase's hand and then Tanya, I'll go back to you. Lynn, so I just want to go back to something that you said. Um, and I just want to get clarification because you talked about the accumulation of contaminants. And I understand that there's a safe, acceptable level and there's an unsafe level. Um, are there areas of the mansion that you would consider to be unsafe level of contaminants? But let's t let's talk about those terms. Um, there are 
there are standards, there are regulations, and there are guidelines. There are no contaminants within the building that exceed regulations. There, the parameters are for things like asbestos, um, some of the other particulate and a few others, those all have regulations that we either are above or below. Those are the speed limit that we have to abide by. In the case of mold and in the case of VOCs, unfortunately or otherwise, we only have guidelines. And those guidelines, if we take them separately for mold, are based on a number of factors. The profile of organisms inside the building versus outside, the concentration of the, of the contaminants inside versus outside, and what is considered a normal indoor concentration of those particular contaminants. On the VOC side of things, we have guidelines from a number of different areas. One is from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. They developed indoor standards for VOCs based primarily on cleanup objectives related to petroleum spills. And the way that they derived a cleanup objective is by studying over 3,000 residential homes heated by heating oil throughout New York State and establishing what the average background level was in those homes. The second standard or guideline that we have for VOCs is derived from the state of California. They've established guideline values for indoor environments. And while we don't live in California, we can certainly look to them as a reference point. And then lastly, we have what is considered LEED certification for buildings based on indoor air quality. These are the green building design techniques that are used today to, to construct buildings in a more healthy manner. So we compare those values that we obtained from the sampling to those different uh, guideline values and we see exceedances and we make remarks about those concentrations. I got it a question the other day about whether or not these results would need to be reported to any particular agency. And the answer is no, because of the reasons I just said. So those values that are in exceedance of the guidelines that we've just established through discussion are the, are the, are the values that we're concerned about, and that's why we're concerned about them. So does that make so sense? Does that for, answer your question? Yeah, just for, just for clarity, there are areas that exceed the guidelines that you just referenced. Correct. Okay. Um, my, okay. Thank you. The distribution of some of those incidences, if we talk about mold, yeah. are generally related more towards the, the first floor and basement areas because yeah. that's the epicenter of the moisture issue. Yeah. VOCs are, are more evenly distributed in different places. That's primarily because VOCs can travel more easily. <laughs> they're not a particle. They're a vapor and a gas. And so they can um, be more evenly distributed. So, okay, all right. So um, my, my, my other question, and then I'll let someone else go. Um, based on the current status and more than likely what you said earlier, the status of the building even last year, and I would even say probably years before, um, it was probably, well, we moved everyone out. I was going to ask, it is our best interest to keep folk out until we um, begin to remedy this issue. I think that you need to consider that you've, you've, you've created a mixed use environment within that building that, that I don't think is appropriate. Thank you. You, are, you have maintenance activities taking place in buildings that are not designed for maintenance on top of the administration uh, activities. I had a discussion with someone in the administration. I said, it's like building a home and having a dinner in the, in the dining room while in the living room, someone's repairing a lawnmower and all the parts are all over the floor. You can intuitively see that those two things probably don't mix from an eight hour, 10 hour a day perspective. So I would first make the decision that maintenance activities get carved out of that building. And then I would pursue the idea that mechanical ventilation is better for the overall health of the environments and will, uh, of the uh, occupants and will also help to diminish the accumulation of contaminants. Excellent. That's part of it. The other part is the issue related to moisture, which I understand, you know, we're, we're tackling the issues of the roof and the foundation. Thank you. All right. Can you put me on the list for a question, Madam Chair? I think it was Terry, then Tanya, and I guess then Cora. Is that the order you have, Antoinette? Um, 
Yeah, T Tanya, do you mind um, if Miss Carrie goes before you, you come back around again since it will be your second go around? Sure. All right, Terry. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Glenn, I hate to have you repeat something. It is basically a yes or no answer, uh, I think. Uh, so should we be in that building right now? Should anybody be operating in that building right now? Um, it's not desirable. Not desirable. I, th I thought I heard you say that. So I, I guess my question is, my next question is for BBS, because BBS, uh, you all said that we could use that building, we could partition parts of it off and, and use that building uh, and move back in and use parts of it. Uh, how, how can you reconcile for me, or do you even agree, I guess, with what Glenn is saying when he said that uh, we've created a mixed-use environment that isn't appropriate? Um, how do you reconcile what he said with what you recommended? Well, we only recommended that when we were asked about construction taking place for the roof. We had no air quality tests done prior to that question. Um, at the time when that meeting, when that was discussed, the meeting uh, board meeting that evening is when we were instructed to, um, I guess, initiate conversations about having air quality testing. So any of the direction we gave was specific to roof construction and whether or not we would expect, you know, the possibility of people being in the building when things were going on. And the partitioning had nothing to do with air quality or anything. It had to do with moving people from one section of the building away from area where construction activities would be taking place. I think the expectation was also that because of the roof leaks that you've had over the years, the ceilings collapsed due to water infiltration, that there would be mold in the building. And that at some point after we got the roof done and we got the outside envelope sealed up, that there would be some testing and whatever remediation was required in order to happen prior to people reoccupying that building. So I think that was our understanding all along. I would just add, uh, not, uh, it, it would probably, we, we came at it from different angles, EnviroScience versus BBS. And the reason you do testing is to um, validate, if you will, or to test a theory or a hypothesis. Certainly BBS could have speculated that yes, that the condition of the building would lead to test results that might not be favorable, but it's only through testing that you'd find that out. So I don't know if it's really fair to ask, and, and many of these things of course, don't have an odor component or it may not be visible. And so it, it, it's, it's not obvious when you just walk through the building without you looking at it from that perspective. Sure, thank you. Uh, just one follow-up question and then I'll wait my turn uh, for the next time uh, to follow up with additional ones. Dr. Chase, um, when you were laying the scenario for us, uh, you said that uh, um, you, uh, you were the one who engaged in viral science. I think you said that. Uh, what factors led you to want to engage in viral science? I think you, I'd like a little bit more detail as to what factors you saw that led you to engage them. So um, there were just concerns and you, know, you just have a, a gut feeling that you just wanna do more to investigate the issues. And I know there's been some conversations about returning people to the mansion, just as what we're doing to the schools. We wanna make sure that our buildings are gonna be safe and prepared to receive people. Um, there were just concerns that, that, that came up through a period of time. Right. Uh, and one final question for now is that I have for, um, Glenn is Glenn. Just could you tell us what are some of the health uh, concerns or risks that may occur because of VOCs? Uh, so VOCs primarily can be carcinogens and can be uh, nervous system uh, threats at at particular concentrations. Different compounds have different risks at different thresholds. But in general terms, VOCs are primarily carcinogens and uh, impact the nervous system. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Oh. Carey, and then Tanya. He looks like he's muted. Ms. Carey, are you there? She was able, yeah, she's, she unmuted herself. There we go. There we go. Uh, I would just like to ask one question to clear up 
uh, a situation or a concern I had. Uh, we were told at one point that the only way to get into that building would to be used, is to use a respirator or I would think a hazmat suit or clothing of that type. Is that what you're recommending? Is that to me, Glenn? Uh, I, yeah, Air Glenn. Person, I presume. Yeah, so that was never a recommendation of mine. Um, if that would have been a recommendation of mine, it would have been in the report. Um, I think right, that there are certain materials. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? No, I said I didn't read it in the report. That's why I'm asking. Oh yeah, no, that's that's not the recommendation per se. There will be the removal and, and, and of certain materials that have been impacted by mold that mm -hmm. will probably require some specialized handling, but to simply go in and out of the building, um, it was never recommended or required that you have a respirator. So. Okay, thank you very much. You. You're welcome. Tracy, are you now raising your hand? Because yeah, I had my hand raised, but I, I think didn't Tanya, see it. Tanya had to go. Oh, Tanya, um, do you mind if Tracy goes since she you went already? Great. All right. All right. I have two two very quick questions now that he said that he didn't say there was no respirator. Who at your company told our administration that we have to have a respirator to go into the building? Nobody at my company except for myself has spoken to the administration about. The building. So, so Dr. Chase, where did that respirator come from? So let's keep the main thing the main thing. Mr. Falcone recommended that we wear um, protective gear for going into the building. And I think that Mr. Um, Glenn has identified, I think, substantial reasons why we should. Um, this recommendation came from Mr. Falcone based on a conversation he had with Glenn. And he interpreted the conversation to me that we need to wear protective gear. So in I my, hear, go ahead, sorry. Sure, in my later, in my later conversation with Glenn, um, he did share with me that those were not his exact words, but what he did share was Dr. Chase, people should wear gloves and they should wear masks yeah, when entering yeah. the mansion. Um, and so that's where we are. And Glenn, am I saying something out of turn? No, not really. I'll just clarify to say that if you were to go in there and, and attempt to recover from the basement area in particular, materials that you'd want to um, uh, use in the future, that there would be certain protective equipment like uh, a Tyvek suit or protective clothing, gloves and eye protection. And you might find it useful to wear the use of a face mask like we're wearing today for the virus if you found yourself susceptible to exposure of of a uh, mold but it's not a requirement <clears throat> okay so of, I, it's not I, oh, let me it's not a requirement of a person going into the building to retrieve anyway. something from their desk or something like that okay so um so so my two questions are because i've heard you say that these um things should be removed from the building correct and that's what you would recommend as opposed to people being in there right now when you say things, I think you mean the contents that might be influencing yes. the VOC yes. values? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. so I'd, I'd like to see the building no longer be a, 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 a repository for, for maintenance materials. So, so if we were back to Mr. Warner's question, if we were to get a shed or a whatever to hold the actual maintenance materials, then you would be fine with that or you would want to do more testing? Um, well, I would not. I would not want to say that yes. Singularly performing that action and removing those materials would suffice. I'd like to see it as part of a comprehensive strategy in addressing the building that would include the removal of those materials, an improvement in the the roof and foundation issues, and the introduction of some sort of mechanical ventilation. Okay, great. And my second question was because you said that. Um, you were talking about the different health risks of some of the chemicals, but then you said that different compounds had different risks at different levels. That's right. There, there's there, Within the sampling that we performed, there were about 200 parameters that we would refer to as VOCs, and those are the exhaustive appendices in the back of the report that you know describe VOCs and SVOCs. Um, so th there are risks are based on the type of the VOC that we're talking about and its concentration. Okay, great. And um, of course that risk would vary from person to person, correct? 
Well, in general terms, but there are permissible exposure limits established by organizations like OSHA and PESH. Um, those numbers are quite high compared to what we're seeing in the this uh, in these results. So we um, don't see. So I hate to interrupt you, but I don't want you to go too far. That's okay. This, this is also not my area. So similar to Dr. Chase, I'm going to ask you to clarify. Um, so you're saying that these levels don't reach the limits that were set by OSHA. Is that what you just said? Correct. Okay, just checking. That that, that would be a that that would be a. Um, it's almost intuitive that's the case because those values are established for people who handle those materials on a daily basis in the workplace. It's not a, an appropriate application of those standards to an administrative office environment. Okay, so um, if that makes sense, it does. So I just didn't want the statement out there that certain compounds ha um, cause certain things without clarifying that there's different levels. So I just wanted you to clarify what you'd said when the different compounds have different risks at different levels. Sure thing. Hey, yes. Glenn, it's Fred from you. DBS. I just have a quick question for you. You know, rather than moving those materials out of the building, and I don't know what volume we're talking about here, but would it be possible to install vented cabinets so that that are vented to the outside in order to have those materials remain in the building if it's a small enough quantity? Sure, if we were to devise a, an engineered strategy that would better isolate the two spaces and would allow for the exhaustion of those uh, products before they accumulated and, to, and were distributed throughout the rest of the administrative space, that would be suitable on its, on its face and it would be borne out through testing. Dr. Chase, I'm going to Tanya, then to you. Um, so, so Antoinette, you know, um, I know that the community is watching this meeting and I've seen uh, requests uh, for, I think over a week now that we make this report public. And I just, I just wanted to just briefly um, tell those people who are listening to us that that um, the building was tested for asbestos, total particulates, radon, mold, and volatile organic compounds, the VOCs that we're mostly um, talking about during this meeting. And I just want everyone to know that the building actually came back negative for asbestos. It came back negative for total particulates. The radons, radon levels were way below uh, so-called EPA actionable levels that in terms of the mold, um, depending on the area of the building that was sampled, uh, there were anywhere between uh, 1,760,000. I think you're breaking up, unless that's my connection. So Tanya, no, say that fine. last part. So the, I'm talking about, I was talking about the mold. Is that one? <laughs> Is it, did I break up at the mold? Yeah. Okay. So the mold was between 1760 and 8,000 spores per meter cubed, whereas the outside air is 8,300. So it was actually less in the building than outside, even though it seems to be that the recommendation for inside is 3,000 spores per cubic meter. So we do have to do a mold remediation in certain areas of the building. And finally, I just wanted to let the community know that, that um, about 30, uh, and Glenn, please correct me if I'm wrong, you, you tested for about 30 different uh, VOCs, uh, all of which were below the 95th percentile uh, allowable, and there were really eight uh, of these molecules that came back pos positive in your test in the sense that they were somewhere between, from, from my reading of this document, somewhere between two to seven times higher than this cutoff level, which you say is sort of a soft cutoff level because there is really, you know, no, at these, at the levels that we're talking about, there is really no, no danger and no real, um, no really known or uh, determined um, health effect. So I just wanted to put that out there for our community. And now I have a question, which is- Can I interrupt you for one second? Yes. Because you did, you did a great job characterizing 
the, almost the entire report. He's a scientist, uh, that's why. <laughs> oh, really? That's great. Um, the last segment about the 95th percentile, and, and you're referring to the, the Department of Health guideline values. Those values, if they're exceeded in an environment where there has been a spill outside of a foundation, and those vapors have been detected inside the foundation, would require remediation. Right. That's why we use that comparative value. It's, it's not applicable because we haven't had a spill. We've had those materials just in the building. And so we compare to that value strictly because there are no other values to which we can apply them. But that they would have to be remediated if it was the result of a spill outside the building. Sure. So that is actually my, my question. Uh, my, there are two parts to my question. First, my first question is to Mr. Falcone and the administration, which is, what, what are these canisters that we have sitting in the basement of the mansion? And do they have these material safety data sheets attached to them? Does Mr. Falcone follow OSHA rules when he is storing uh, these materials? What are they? What exactly is, is down there? There, there's been old chemicals that uh, um, that I found, and I've been getting rid of them slowly to the uh, Worcester County, uh, the disposable area near the jail that's over there. But there is so much of it, I could not take all of it at once. And we are we are removing them slowly, as I did with uh, Mr. Mensch. I had, I had to bring some of his stuff in there because uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but they also had a lot of chemicals from the science center. So I, you know, lessened my, my side to try to get rid of the science stuff. But we're trying to get rid of stuff slowly. Um, I did reach out to uh, other directors of facilities trying to get something on state contract. Otherwise, trying to get three prices is pretty hard to get rid of all the chemicals at once. And it's probably, they also want to know what's inside the container. Some of these containers are so old, they have nothing. All the paper that's on them is gone. You can smell it. We do have them. We pulled them out closer to the garage because we didn't want the smell that's in the back. Uh, I think it was underneath the uh, superintendent's office, but a little at a time. There's also, I'm sure there's tons of spills on the floor. If you went in the, uh, in the basement, you'll see you know stains on the floor. Um, whether it's paint thinners, paints, uh, um, old cleaning uh, products, Everything that we purchased since I've been here, we have SDS sheets. Okay, so I, I do follow um, OSHA rules since I've been there. I can't, you know, I'm trying to clean up what has been passed. So I, I understand there's a, a company called Safety Clean. I mean, could they be contacted to just get rid of everything? I mean, why? Absolutely, 100%. If they're not on, say, contract, then you have to get three prices. So Safety right. Clean, one, one, uh, um, uh, one place here, and it's hard. Once again, they want to know what's in the container. Otherwise, they don't take it. I mean, I'm just a little surprised that these things have been sitting there for so long and that we've just let them sit there. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, this is like, a, you know, I mean, it is a problem, but like, why is it now a problem and not like, I don't know how many years ago? I've been getting rid of chemicals every year. If I came in here and I said you had four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars worth of chemicals to get rid of right off the bat, I mean, there's been a lot of chemicals in all of my buildings. You're muted, after that. Thank you. I, um, I heard Mr. Falcone that you said, um, and, and Tanya mentioned like the use of that company Safety Clean. Who have you been using um, while you've been getting rid of the materials? Worcester County. Okay, Westchester County. Is there would there be um, like a cost difference, or like why Westchester County versus um, I guess this Safety Clean? Which is the county, they're not asking me what's on the side of the um, pails. Safety Clean, they want to know exactly what you're getting rid of. Okay. And so is it because you can't see the labels anymore? It's like they wouldn't take the those canisters away? They want to know what's inside the canister. Okay. There's no more, there's no more labels on there. 
And if you can't, that prevents them from taking them. Of safety clean. Yes. Okay. I'm trying. I'm going to try other companies that uh, I, I reach out to. You know, other directors to see what they would do. But okay. They all want to know what we are getting rid of. All right. Thank you, um, Dr. Chase. Then David. So my question, and my question that I had just popped up on the chat because I'm more so concerned about the health and safety of the staff and there were young kids in the building. What I'd like to know, and just getting back to that, um, and maybe Glenn, uh, Jim, or Fred can answer, based on what we heard today, could those contaminants that are obviously at the mansion, could they have, do they have different effects for adults than they would with children? Yes, that's a great question. And it's one that has not currently been answered, but it's been asked a number of times recently. Um, as you may or may not know, I, 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 I was an investigator on an, a school uh, in Suffolk County regarding uh, the effects of VOCs and other contaminants on children. And the state is lacking in guidance values for VOCs in schools. And um, we understand that that's forthcoming at some point in the future, but there currently is not a, a two standard system, one for adults and one for children. I just wanted to, I hope that answers your question. Just to backtrack a second no, on- my question, Glenn. I'm sorry? It answered my question, Glenn, thank okay, you. Okay, great. So just to backtrack on, on where these compounds are coming from, also many of these compounds are found strictly in gasoline and in other petroleum based products. So it's not just you know, the, the skull and crossbone chemicals per se, but it's also just the volatilization of, of things like uh, gasoline and, and motor oils, diesel fuels that can um, contribute to the, to the concentrations we're seeing here. So, so since I think I still have the floor, I think so. So are you talking about like when we have the, um, uh, when we have the trucks that are in the basement, so some of the gasoline from those trucks are the fumes are emitting upstairs? And sure, and it's just the use of fuels and, and solvents and oils in that space as part of regular maintenance. It's not that it that you both, I mean, Mr. Falcone has spoken also to the storage of chemicals that have been accumulated district-wide and stored centrally temporarily until he can dispose of them. That's one aspect of things. The other aspect is just the daily use of this facility as a maintenance facility for small engines and for vehicles and things like that that require fuels, you know, solvents, lubricants, things like that. Okay, David. Um, All right. Hey, Terry. Uh, regarding the uh, mysterious unlabeled uh, canisters, um, can can Glenn label them? Can EnviroScience go back and say, uh, we think that what's in this, uh, this, this can is X. And then as a result of, of uh, being able to label it, then you can go back and, uh, and get somebody to dispose of it. And so what you're referring to, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, yeah, answer that person then, uh, yeah. So you're referring to a service called lab packing, basically. This is where compounds and chemicals that cannot be identified by their labeling are identified through analytical methods to establish whether or not they can be disposed of together or whether they have an interaction that would prohibit them from that um, disposal and storage together. There are companies like Safety Clean and others that specialize in that, in that service. Um, and the goal for performing that is number one, safety, and number two is cost. If you can't characterize a, a chemical in some way, then it gets disposed of as if it was the most ha level, uh, most hazardous level for disposal, and that gets very expensive. So you'd like to to differentiate those compounds strictly from safety and from cost. So ballpark, what does this service cost? It's a function of the materials that are stored down there. I, I will tell you, I didn't inventory or even I, I couldn't even venture a guess as to assess. You know, maybe Mr. Falcone could speak more to what the quantity is of things down there, but I, I didn't assess that. Okay. Okay, so that, that's one avenue to pursue. So then the next thing that I, I just heard, and this goes back and forth between uh, the architects and, uh, and you, uh, I guess the question is to shed or not to shed? Uh, should we construct a separate building, move things to it, 
or is it better to ventilate everything in place? I, I think that's the question, and I, I kind of figure maybe the cost of building the shed will come into play, and also a safety factor. I don't know how far away you'd have to put it, but we do have land, so you know, how do we determine which is which is a better solution? I, I'm sorry to interject, but maybe we should just get rid of it. Yeah, we will, but there will be new chemicals. There oh, will be new chemicals. There are activities that still need to be performed, the maintenance type of activities that are small engine and, and vehicle related. Um, there's a question of fire code that I'm sure uh, Fred can speak to. Then there's, there's the benefit of having those things isolated in a separate building dedicated for that use versus trying to mechanically develop a, a system that, of course, is subject to failure and that might not provide the unequivocal isolation of those two spaces. Next was, I believe. Hey. Well, well, wait, wait, could we have oh, the architect sorry. weigh in? On which part, the building, having a separate building, could, David? Could we build a separate shed? Or maybe it's a maintenance court, I'm not sure. David. Um, right now, the, you know, the way you're, facility is set up, I guess it's an integral part of the building, this, um, you know, you store vehicles, lawnmowers, snow blowing equipment, um, you know, you'd have to consider, I guess, the cost for how big this shed is ultimately going to need to be. Uh, you're talking about not like a little 10 by 10 building, we're talking 60 by 40, you know, to kind of put that sort of um, material in. So it's going to be very, uh, costly to construct. Um, you know, we'd have to really look at the, the building itself um, for the purpose of what a mechanical system would be uh, needing to do and, and maybe better doors, um, taking care of the interior of the uh, spaces that don't have proper sheetrock to uh, prevent the gases from getting in between openings and floorboards and Areas that need caulking around pipes that penetrate floors, um, things like that, that allow the you know the gases to mi mitigate and migrate throughout the building. So there is, you know, work that could be done. Um, you know, a lot of things that would need to be done in, in conjunction with the mechanical system to isolate, as Glenn had mentioned, um, the, the maintenance activities from the administrative activities. May I may I uh, uh, intervene? Uh, one minute. Um, since I took my maintenance uh, staff out of the administration building, because we used to park two vehicles in the garage, and we also had maintenance activity with the lawnmowers, leaf blowers, everything else in the garage. Okay. Um, I took everyone out, um, and I ended up clearing the five bay garage over at uh, the teacher center. Okay. So, so right now we have all the uh, most of the gas is out. We didn't get all the paints out yet, but I wanted to get all the paints out to bring it over there. Yes, we might, we're gonna have to do ventilation and insulate that building, okay, but you don't have to construct a building. We have a building that we're going to, um, uh, we're going to now occupy and, and use. You've been able to renew, okay. Thank you. Antoinette? Sorry, Ashley, oh. and, and then I think Terry, Terry, your blue hand is down. So I, I took his name. I, I took the blue hand down because you called his name. So it was Ashley, Terry, and then me, but I'll defer and let Tanya ask her question. Oh, and Miss Carrie, you too. Am I correct? Yeah, I would like it. I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, come up in the rear. Okay. So just really quickly, if we could, um, it's 627 now. So if we could finish some of the board questions, I believe. We have um, several questions, multiple questions in the chat that um, I'd like to be able to get to. All right, so Ashley. Uh, Mr. Falcone, this question is for you. So um, you mentioned that there are VOC um, containing uh, liquids potentially in our other buildings. Um, any, any ballpark on, is it more than what's currently in the mansion? What is the plan? I understand you're having, it takes time to get rid of these things. Um, what is our, what is your recommendation for how we get rid of what we can get rid of um, across all of our buildings? Um, right now, all the chemicals that I found in all the other buildings, especially that's labeled, 
is in the five bay garage, which is dwindled down because we've been getting rid of it a little at a time. Okay, I, I haven't uh, tackled, you know, the big stuff that's at the, um, the mansion. Um, but as uh, I think Len said, it's probably also the gas that we stored there. It's also, um, we have oils that we store in the, in the garages down there. So, you know, hopefully when I move my staff out of there, that'll help out. Okay, so the plan, it sounds like, is your plan moving forward is you're going to maintain that type of chemical compounds in the five, gate, five bay garage as opposed to the school buildings and the administration building. Am I correct? Yeah, I emptied that years ago from all the other buildings. Okay, so Bailey School, Highview School, Ellis Jackson. Okay, I, I've emptied all out any chemicals that I saw that we didn't use or we didn't have any um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, SDS sheets. I emptied them out years ago, okay? And it's been in this in this garage over here and we've been just getting rid of it slowly, a little at a time. Um, and it's very interesting that this is coming up because uh, I'm still trying to look for a company and see how much it's gonna cost to get rid of it. And somebody that would look at it and say, it could be this type of a chemical. Okay. Um, Thank you. Next was Terry and then Tanya. Yep. Thank you, Tracy. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, going back to uh, Dr. Chase, um, early on when you were describing the scenario again, you said uh, you had some concerns um, from staff members that were brought to you. Um, what were some of those concerns? I know I'm muted. I know. Uh, you know, I, I rely a lot on my buildings and grounds person, and I rely a lot on our previous, um, and of course our current um, architect. Both brought concerns to me about the structure of the building. Um, the fact that there were water between the walls, which I know will lead to mold. Mold is not healthy although we're not talking about it a lot here in this conversation, it exists. I saw mold growing on my wall um, at the mansion. Um, and so there were concerns. And I have to be concerned with the health and the safety of the people who occupy the mansion, as well as the young kids who are there to, um, to learn. Um, there were other um, concerns that were brought to my attention that were bothersome. Um, I don't feel comfortable sharing that right here, but there were other concerns and they were, it was more hearsay concerns. Um, but, um, and then some were, were verified concerns. Um, you know, I, I think that the right thing that we could have done was to move everyone out of the mansion and I stand by that decision. Sure. <laughs> uh, support. Sure. Um, and one question for Glenn, um, since we're kind of wrapping up here, uh, this has been on my mind. Uh, Glenn, you were supposed to be here on Friday to meet with the board for a, a meeting. Uh, why did you not come on Friday? Um, I, it may sound simple. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I don't know what you mean about a meeting on Friday. This is the only meeting I know about. Uh, there, there was discussion there was a about- a board meeting scheduled. About, oh, there was discussions about me ultimately meeting with the board but there was never anything definitive until today. And in fact, this- Right, because that, that meeting was canceled, Glenn. I, okay. I guess my question is, did you cancel that meeting, Glenn? Because we, <laughs> we heard from Mike, that Mike Falcone, that you were available Thursday and Friday. I didn't cancel a meeting. Uh, there was never <laughs> a meeting, please. I'm, I, I, I sound like a babbling idiot. I don't really understand. I'm sorry, um, Glenn. I didn't know about No, you this. don't. Please don't interrupt him. Sorry, Glenn. Okay, it's all right. I, 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 I did not cancel a meeting. I mean, to answer your question, the... I, did not, I did not cancel a meeting. Thank I you. also didn't know right, about thank a meeting. You. Um, and next was um, Tanya. Sorry, hold on for one second. I didn't hear the last thing you said, Glenn. I didn't cancel a meeting, but I also didn't know about a meeting definitively until today's yeah. meeting. It's okay. All right, there there have you. been talks about having meetings in the past, about how the I was going to interact with the board. I think there was talk about perhaps doing a walkthrough with some of the board members or having a, a separate 
working group meeting. These were all just concepts. There was nothing ever definitive. Thank you, Glenn. And I certainly well, it, it, it may have been a concept to you. It was communicated. It, it was communicated to us, and it may not have been communicated to you. I'm giving you the benefit of my doubt. I, you know, there's uh, there's always two sides to at least two sides to a story. And our side of the story was that it was more uh, concrete than was conveyed to you. So I was just, I'm trying to get at the truth. So, you know, there you have it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I think after- Next week, Tanya, Tanya you Yes, we always get derailed. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Sorry, Glenn. Um, Tanya and then David. Well, what I, I was going to say something slightly different, but now I want to preface it with a bit of an, a response to what Dr. Chase just said, which is that, that there is, um, there is um, anxiety and fears and uh, things that people think, and then there are scientific facts. And um, I really have to commend Glenn on having been so professional um, and, and so, precise with the information that he has provided us with. And it seems to me that this building really doesn't pose a danger. And furthermore, since it's empty and we are first planning to, you know, fix the roof and the envelope, I mean, on some level, I'm just even wondering if we really even need to address this. I'm, I'm wondering if we really need to address this issue of these vats of chemicals in the basement ASAP, or if they can, you know, if uh, Mr. Falcone can now perhaps more proactively look for a company that will really get rid of at least the ones that can be gotten rid of. Okay, I think next was David, then Cora, then Dr. Chase. I'm sorry, David. I think Dr. Chase has her hand up as a response. Oh, okay, Dr. Chase. Yeah, so I, I just want to respond to Dr. Drodrick's comment. Um, I think that there are accounts at the mansion that are real. They're not fear, they're not anxieties. There are people who've brought real situations to my attention. Um, and I don't want people to feel that there are, um, that their, their, their concerns are not validated, nor their concerns not heard. They brought those concerns to me. And as their superintendent, I acted on those concerns. So I, I just don't want it to be perceived. And I don't believe that's your intention, but I don't want it to be perceived that those concerns that were brought to my attention were based on anxieties and that there aren't facts. I think Glenn gave us some pretty clear facts today. And I believe that you know people can um, form their own opinions about it, but there are some very real accounts from the mansion over the course of the eight years I've been in the district. Um, and there was some things that we really needed to address ASAP. Okay, so um, next I had date, I forgot the list now. I think it's David and then Cora. Yeah. Is that, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, moving on to the building conditions survey, I know that we had uh, a number of items listed in our in our five year uh, plan uh, for the administration building heat generating system six hundred sixteen thousand dollars ventilation system two point one million pipe heating and cooling one hundred forty seven thousand HVAC control systems two hundred fifty thousand if I look at the item that I think comes closest to ventilation requirements. Uh, it's, it's item 88. If you if you look in the building condition survey that's posted on our website, um, in the in the comments it says provide mechanical fresh air for all spaces throughout the building. Assume 30 additional spaces total 1.5 million dollars. Now I'm trying to figure out do we need to implement everything that's in the BCS to get ventilation? Is it a subset? Is the is the subset the thing I just read? Uh, is it about $1.5 million to do the cleanup? Do we know yet? So the answer to your question is that that $1.5 million is not the entire building. It doesn't include the items that were mentioned previously in the report. So you would have to add them to the $1.5 million to get the total dollar amount. For instance, All right, so it's the, greater than $1.5 million. 
Yes, correct. Okay. Okay, David, you, you finished that, or you have follow-up? That's my main question. Okay, right? sorry. I didn't we want to figure out how to finance things and we need to come back with some kind of proposal for what we need to do before we reopen the building. And can we do that? Who are you asking, David? I guess that's probably Fred Seba uh, in consultation with Glenn. We can certainly put together a, a, you know, a compilation of what's in the BCS. That's the information. And we've given you that information. Right. And I know Glenn talked about the importance of having mechanical ventilation in the building. And he's right in the fact that mechanical ventilation we can control. Natural ventilation, which is the way that building was designed, and it meets code. I had extensive conversations with the state education department. It is allowed by current code, and you are allowed to continue to, to occupy that building. Um, so I did not put requirement for mechanical ventilation on there as a necessity for you to get staff back in that building. So okay. if you decide you want mechanical ventilation because it's better, then we, I can certainly add those items up and I can give them back to you to let you know. But Right, uh, so did skipping back those. to my first set of questions, what I, what I got from the environmental expert was, do you recommend that we put in mechanical ventilation before we reoccupy the building? And he said, yes. So therefore, I'd like you to come up with a subset from, uh, from the BCS that you think would meet that requirement. That, that's my request to the board. Okay. Certainly do. Um, I'm sorry. Did you have your answer, David, before we move on? That's it. That's my I request. If that's what the will of the board is, then, then I'm good. I know that Cora was waiting to speak, and I also saw Mary's hand up. Okay. Um, Mary, you're going to, I think, be the last, so we can get to the um, community questions. Okay, hi, thank, hi, good evening, everyone. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I'm Mary. I apologize, okay. Miss Carrie first, then you, Mary. Okay. Or. Go ahead, let her go. I said I'd be last. Or says she okay. wanted to bring up the rear. I apologize. Okay, um, Mary, please continue. Okay, thank you. Um, Glenn, hi, this is Mary O'Neill again. Um, I just have a quick question. Can you let me know how many rooms you actually tested at the mansion? And then at the same time, how many rooms tested higher, had higher levels of the mold and how many rooms had higher levels of VOC? Okay, um, just give me a second because I don't I'd have to go through all that. Okay. We tested 16 of uh, mold specifically we tested 16 locations, 15 inside the building, and one outside the building. We have flagged a number of locations based on both their concentration and the profile of the organisms within those locations. And primarily, those locations were, I'm trying, there's, there's none to exclude except for the first floor kitchen, the first floor boardroom. The uh, first floor superintendent. And the garage for mold. For mold. So out of the 15 rooms. Oh, and, and, and one more, I'm sorry. Uh, the ground floor maintenance. So that's four if i if i added that right four out of 15 so 11 of them tested pause or came in higher at higher levels yeah you i'm doing this on the fly so okay yeah i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna sound silly i'm gonna the last location is also considered acceptable the ground floor west storage so that sounds like five out of 15 were acceptable 10 would be considered elevated and would the recommendation would be remediation okay so i'm 10 out of 15 and what about the uh, mary can the i just interrupt can I just interrupt you for one second? I'm sorry. I just want to understand because I was writing and I'm following you. And then um, I know Mary tried to clarify. So you're saying the kitchen, board of ed room, superintendent's office, garage, and maintenance were the five, correct? Were higher yes. than no, elevated. They're, no? They're, they're, they're acceptable. The other 10 are elevated. Thank you. Thank you. I was confused. Okay. And th that's for mold. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Rifle. Yes, I know there was. So now, are you asking the same question about VOCs? About the VO, the same for VOCs. Okay, VO. so it might be easier for me to reference the section of the report than to read all of that, those locations, but if you can look at page, um, oh, page numbers would be nice, but section 5.4 VOCs, and you can look to see where those compounds were exceedances compared to the New York State guidelines, and then see the locations. There are, for, for instance, um, 111 trichloroethane occurs in almost every location. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, not, uh, 7, 8, 10, 11, 13, 14, and 15. Does, any, so does anyone know what page out of 115 that is? It's uh, in our electronic copy of the report. It's page, just one second. Seven. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Seven. I was all the way in the 50s. Okay, seven. Thank you. You're welcome. Miss Carrie, I believe. Yeah, Miss Carrie, you're, you're the last. Okay. I just want to uh, say that um, I did want to make sure that we uh, got the question answered uh, that I asked earlier because. Quite a commotion in the community by some parents after they heard about the um, respirator and the hazmat suit. Uh, so I'm glad it was cleared up, but I want to make it very clear that that kind of talk can cause a lot of um, uh, a panic in people. And I think we need to get our words together and get them straight so that we will not have to cause that kind of concern. Uh, in some areas of the community. <clears throat> so, excuse me. <clears throat> so that's what I basically wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Tracy, we are getting to the um, questions um, in our chat um, regarding, you know, the, the mansion discussion. And the first question was posted at 547. So we have about an hour's, <laughs> an hour amount of questions, um, but we're only going to we're only going to answer for 30 minutes. Okay. Um, no, the questions have to be just about the mansion, correct? Yes, about this topic right now. Okay. Um, please provide a summary list of the mansion fixes and the corresponding cost for each fix in order to open the mansion safely for our children but we're not opening that. So I'm gonna skip that one. Um, I don't think that's for each building. Um, okay. Please outline which of those items and resolve issues from BCS and what were additional measures taken to improve safety vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. Is that specifically related related to the mansion? I don't know. It's just what was written. I'm reading what was posted from. I guess Laser posted it exactly from the YouTube. Um, okay, I'll skip that. If items, and I know Chris Allen posted that, so she could re repost like a full question so they can answer. Um, if items are removed from storage, are there still residue VOC issues? So someone can answer that. Um, I, I would like to give a definitive answer on that, but I would, I would need to do an investigation to see if there has been an impact of the slab from uh, spills of those materials that would require further remediation than simply just removing the materials from the space. So the answer is there could be, but it can't be answered at this time. Okay. Sorry, I muted myself. Okay, so um, possibly, but you wouldn't know that right now. You would have to do more testing. Is that accurate? Um, it, it would be a combination of testing and, and a visual inspection. Okay, an inspection including testing. Okay. That's right. Um, and Amy Wang asks, is air quality report available to the public? That's the question of the day. I, I thought like at the last meeting, 
I don't know who said it, but I thought at the last meeting that it could be um, requested from the district court. I, I thought that was said, Dr. Chase. Just think that um, so one of the things I am going to request is that we are consistent with report sharing because there are some reports shared, some are not. BCS is shared, some are not. So if we're going to share reports, either we're going to share all or we're going to share none. Um, so I don't know how Chase, you can you clarify if, yeah. if I heard correctly? Yeah. Maybe I didn't. So no, there are people who are asking to foil it, right? So there are people who are asking to foil it now. So I mean, right, sorry, Ivy. And so is it, I don't know if it's worth sharing the lawyers here, perhaps maybe he can shed some light on, on how that works. Yeah, I just remember hearing something like that the two weeks ago when you spoke about it. Uh, I'd be happy to comment on that. I think uh, if to the extent different documents are being considered for disclosure or if they're being foiled, I suggest you send them to us for, for a review. Much of this stuff may well be um, properly shared, but there might be aspects of it that are confidential. Um, so I, I suggest you send it to us and we'll take a quick look and, and report back to you. Thank you, Larry. Okay, great. Um, Antoinette, I have a question. Do you want to interrupt the public speaking, Terry? Go right ahead. I don't want to interrupt. I just want to do what you did and interrupt and interject when there's something important. So, uh, Antoinette, no problem, Antoinette, my, Antoinette, I have a question for you. So, if if after Larry's review, the report is basically uh, either fully disclosable or you know redacted in a um, in a minor way, should should we possibly just put it on the uh, website and 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 let people download it? Uh, and Larry, you can weigh in here as well uh, because again, we want to obviously there's a sense of heightened sensitivity here with this. We want to. Uh, uh, show that we're being open uh, and talking about a, 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 a sensitive subject like this, why not just make it available if, number one, certainly if it's clear, and number two, even if it, there's some redaction to it? Just a thought. You're asking me, Terry, or? Well, I'm asking through you because you're the president, but I mean, I'm asking all of us, and I'm asking Larry, too, I guess, to, uh, to see if that is something that's uh, viable. Uh, you know, why make the, the public go through hoops to get something that they're clearly interested in? And, and again, if Larry says, if after his reading of it, says there's nothing here, or even if there's a few things that do need to be redacted, why not be open? Uh, and, and, and make it easy for the public to get something. We don't have anything to hide. I can, Terry, uh, this I just, is, I'm, Terry, oh. I, I'm Larry, you can um, respond, give me a second. So Terry and to David, what has been the past practice? You guys have been on the board um, longer than us. Have you guys done that in the past? I'm just curious. I, I think um, uh, certainly we haven't had an example like this. Um, I mean, in general with post yeah, yeah, in general, I mean, <sighs> I, I, I struggle, well, for number one, the, 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 the number one thing is the, the internet has not been always uh, as, 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 as much of an internet, equal. The internet's been, what is it, since 2000 or something Excuse me, like excuse me, excuse right, me. The point, see, the point that I'm making, I've the point that I'm making, the point that I'm making, uh, Antoinette, is that it, it hasn't always been as easy to, to go to get stuff off the internet. Yeah, it's been around for a while. So and we've had a bad- never did this before. Excuse me, excuse me. And we, <laughs> Just excuse answer me. the question. Excuse me, excuse me. Um, <laughs> so we haven't, thank you, Antoinette. Thank you for being the adult here. Um, not that you're not, but for showing somebody how to be one. So um, the point being that, you know, obviously the internet has evolved and allowed us to do certain things. So let's let's do that to, to be um, mm. fully transparent to the public. David, uh, to Larry's point, this, is that things like I, this get posted, things having to do with personnel issues don't get posted. This is not a personnel issue as far as I can tell. So we would post it. So you have done it in the past, David. We have posted we have posted BCSs in the past. Excuse me. I right. see Dr. Chase's hand and I hear Cora. Madam Chair, I've been on board six years before, three almost three years now. I've been with the district and worked in the district and been a parent and advocate in the district for over 50 years. I will tell you this. If they say certain things are posted anywhere, okay, on the bulletin board, in the paper, it hasn't been so. And I do not believe that important issues have been posted on the internet over the years, okay? Because there have been certain board members who have not wanted the 
public to know what was going on and also suggested that the public uh, speaking terms time be eliminated. And when that didn't work, was told, let's make give them two minutes. That's all they need. So I don't know. All of this stuff all of a sudden about the public, when we were always uh, wanting the public to know what was going on, we've always wanted to be transparent, but in some ways or another, we have been hindered. Okay? Now, this is what I, what I would suggest, if I may. I would so this is an improvement. Wait, wait. Hold, 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 hold on, David. Ms. Carey, what were you saying? Make a suggestion. David, don't start up with me. Okay? You haven't been in this district long enough to do that. Okay? So just let me just say this. I would suggest that anything that we speak in public should be put on the Internet or whatever you want people to look at and, and see for themselves. If you're going to discuss it in public, why can't it be, 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 be put on the, um, I don't know, you know that internet I'm going to mute know. your breathing, Terry. I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. It's, it's just because you have the mic, Terry, that's it. All right. So Ms. All, I'm saying, all I'm saying is there's no reason why it, it hasn't been done. No. But there's no reason why it shouldn't be done now. All right. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Larry, were you planning to chime in? I thought I saw you trying to answer something. Well, that, that was earlier. I, I just wanted to make a suggestion that we take a look at the document first. Um, and, you know, once that's done, we can have a conversation about, about uh, posting or not, but ultimately that's going to be the board's call. Thank For what it's worth, if you could allow me to chime in as the author of the report and I, yes. bring the, I bring the experience of having been on a board of education before and also I've written these reports for school districts for over 30 years. There's no good reason not to share this document with the community. Um, it, and I say that strictly because I think it's information that everyone should be able to digest. Other districts do that, especially when issues become singular and, and take on um, more significance than others. Um, there are times when we do uh, some testing in, in, in micro areas where it doesn't get posted, but this seemingly, given the, the discussion having lasted as long as it has and that it's been going on for some time, uh, most districts would share this information with their community. And the report's written to be shared with the community, meaning that it, it, it tries to tell a story that everybody can understand at least and, and not be overly complicated. That, that, that's my two cents and you can you can take it as you will. But Larry's right about about wanting these things to be open so that they can be discussed. There's no cloak and dagger stuff here, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Glenn. Can we hold? Because we're getting, Tracy, are you getting any answers? Well, I was going to ask, should we, no. Yes. I'm going to ask, Let's should we go, go back, back to the yep. public? But I also saw Dr. Chase's hand. I saw Terry's hand. I don't know if you want me to continue. I would like to more. let Dr. Chase, Dr. Chase, you're changing mind. Well, I was going to ask Mary, just so that there's um, some factual information about what was posted and what's not, because a lot of that is posted under her department. I was going to ask Mary about what was posted so that we're putting factual information out. But um, being that we've already resolved moving yeah. forward, um, I'm not going to belabor the topic. I want to give the community okay. a chance to speak. Thank okay. Um, so I'm going to go, I'm trying to find the question. Gosh, there's a lot of stuff in here. Okay. Um, building by building, I asked items removed from storage. Is uh, it was air, is air quality report available to the public? That's where we got stopped. Okay, I understand there are some ventilation issues inherent in the design of the administration building mansion that may not be resolved easily. Static air safety may be resolved, but needs circulating air time for excuse me air for COVID time. So is there any what I'm taking from that, is there any difference between what we need to do now with COVID um, here with regard to the air in the mansion? Well, as Glenn mentioned before, one of the primary uh, weapons against COVID and spread of the disease is ventilation. Um, that's certainly a recommendation of all of the experts. That's one of the few that everyone can agree on. And the mansion does not have ventilation. But the mansion was built as a house, just as your house was, you know, my house, my house does not have any mechanical ventilation either. Um, and again, so we've had lengthy discussions with the state. The mansion does not require ventilation. It meets code as it, it exists. 
Would ventilation be mechanical ventilation be a good thing? It would because we can control it. With natural ventilation, we can't. It's based upon wind pressure, wind direction, how many people have their windows open. It's based on a lot of different things. So it's not controllable the same way that mechanical ventilation is. So, um, you know, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, it is in the report. We do have mechanical ventilation in the report as a recommendation, but I did not put it in as a requirement for reoccupancy of that building because you do meet code in your current state. Okay. And Antoinette. What? Antoinette is muted. Oh, just no, you just go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, if someone is in the building for a prolonged period of time, could the mold or VOCs impact someone's health? In a general sense, the answer is, is obviously yes. Uh, everyone's sensitivities are different. Um, certainly from the mold side of things, mold is both an allergen as well as an asthmatic trigger to those susceptible. Um, one of the reasons we don't have regulations regarding mold is that there are a myriad of different types of organisms and concentrations for each of those types that um, one size does not fit all um, as far as that goes. The VOCs uh, we spoke about earlier, obviously at different concentrations, they can be neurotoxins or carcinogens. Okay, thank you. Um, again, about the website, and then what is the projected cost, excuse me, of the mechanical ventilation installation at the mansion? I think that was a question that Mr. Warner asked before, so I will prepare that and I will send that on to the board for your review. Also, include how long it would take for installation. And I don't think the next one is really a question. And this on top of repairing the roof and foundation of building to waterproof. So yes, it would be on top of it, right? Okay. Yes. Um, next question is, if a respirator is not required to retrieve items from so storage, would it be preferred for liability issues? So, so uh, uh, the use of respirators is, is regulated, as you have probably made aware since uh, the virus has become prominent. Anything more than an N95 requires a respiratory protection program that involves fit testing, medical surveillance, things like that. Again, I'll reiterate that for a person to want to go into the building to retrieve items that are personal or to get uh, you know, a file or something like that, it's not necessary to wear a respirator. There will be a time when the district has decided that there are items, I apologize for the plane, I'm outside. Uh, there'll be a time when the district decides that they no longer need certain items that are either impacted by mold growth or, or um, are obsolete, where the bulk uh, movement of those items and then the decontamination of the spaces, especially with regards to mold, will take place. Those people will wear personal protective equipment. That would include a respirator. They'll be outside hired people that will do that work. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so people can go in and get, like like you said, a file without a res respirator, you're saying? Absolutely. And I would, okay. send my, I would send my children into the building to go get something of theirs if they had to do that without any concern. Thank you. Oh, it, you know, I, I've been confused by this my whole life. Uh, if the test results come back negative, you know, it sounds like that's bad, but that's good. That means that we haven't discovered or encountered the contaminant that we're looking for. So negative results are good. Positive results are bad. Great, um, thank you. Uh, completely negative. How many, oh, these questions are the same. Um, would your findings impact young children differently than adults? Dr. Chase already read that one. Um, when you, okay, so I guess this is a question for Mr. Falcone. When using Westchester County to dispose of chemicals and solvents, how often are they being brought to Valhalla? And are you only able to bring a certain amount of chemicals at a time? I'm only allowed to bring a certain amount at a time and I have to uh, notify them ahead of time. And um, at one time we were cut off because we ended up getting too many, too much chemicals. And that's why I've been looking at else other places 
But um, yeah, you only can deliver so much. Mr. Falcone? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, he's I, I, I heard you said you can only deliver some. Um, there's more of a question, sorry. Um, how much left, I guess, how much left do we have that needs to be disposed of? If I had to guess, I have probably, I'm guessing maybe another 100 gallons. And then how many can we bring at a time? Well, those the 55 gallon drums that we have there, I have to get a, a company to do that. I can't bring that. I have two 55 gallon drums that we don't know what's inside them. We're guessing there's soaps. That's a guess. Okay. Could the existing level of mold and VOCs potentially cause health issues or worsen existing health issues if an individual entered the building or spent significant time in the building? I think I answered that already. Okay. Um, but I'll, if you want, I'll do it again. You know, the mold is a known asthmatic trigger as well as an allergen. And so your sensitivities will vary person to person. The VOCs obviously depend on the time, the duration of exposure, the concentration of the exposure, and the nature of the of the chemical. You know which chemical we're talking about. Okay, thank you for answering that again. I've seen it a couple of times, and I'm being texted about it, so I'm, I, you might have to answer that again. So thank you. Okay. Um, my question was a follow up. What suggested remediation at the mansion resolve issues? from the BCS and what additional measures will be taken regarding COVID-19. Yeah, and I don't believe that mansion is going to be occupied. So I really did not make any recommendations regarding COVID-19 specifically regarding that mansion. The recommendations that I did make are in the BCS and that's just in general for the mansion. And there are a number of ventilation issues that are cited in there. Okay, someone else asked again, will that information be posted on the website? We, um, Glenn said it should be fine and our lawyer is gonna look at it and then it should be posted on the website. That's what I understand. Um, would anyone on this Zoom panel send their kids to this building? I've had two kids go through this building. I don't know if anyone else wants to answer the call. Um, at what, let, me, let me just answer it. I'm not bringing children back into the building. At what level of at what level of remediation would you feel comfortable to send your kids? I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. And then this is about a specific board member that I'm not going to answer, so it really should not have been posted. I mean, I'm not going to ask. Um, is there any other questions? I know Lasers kind of picking them from, I guess, the YouTube chat. I don't know if there are any more. Okay. I think you're muted, Antoinette. I am muted. Okay, so um, thank you, um, James, Fred, and Glenn for um, joining us today. I'm glad you guys were all um, able to make it today. So thank you so much. Um, we are going to again follow up in regards to this report. Lawyers will take a look at it and then we'll go forward from there. Um, that is it for the public portion of, of the meeting. We're going to go into, um, wait, let me, I gotta make sure Steve, let me make sure Steve is here. Steve, you gotta let me know, I guess when you're ready again. I can just go in right now directly or do you need to do something, Steve? We're getting ready to go into ex executive session. All right. Yep, you're in the waiting room. Um, let's see. So again, Glenn, Fred, um, and James, we really appreciate you guys being here. Um, I can, I guess I can, um, remove you from the meeting or you guys could just um, click out and um, leave the meeting yourself. But thank you so much. We really appreciate your time with us today.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. Have a good one. Bye bye. To all right, so they are move. Um, we are wait, 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 Steve. We are going to enter into 